What is happening? <laughs> Hello, Roberts. I think you were talking. I think that's our, our audio. Yeah, that's all right. You know. <laughs> what is happening? He's kidding. Keep the clock running. He's kidding. I. Oh, yeah, it's good. This is good. Yeah, I'm loosened, loosened up and ready right to go. Up. That's what we keep talking. Hey, about. We want this to be conversational and natural and loose. Here we are. And here we are. We're all loosened up. So How it's you doing, good. Jeffrey? Yeah, I'm doing good, man. How are you today? It's a great and glorious day to talk about the glory of God. It is a great and glorious day to talk about the glory of God. It actually uh, is is a very beautiful day, and I know you meant that in a number of ways. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking about the topic of the glory of God today, which is a commonly discussed topic in our circles, and that's important because. The Bible talks about it all over the place, and in your sermon series last Sunday, the passage you were in in John 17, it came up quite a few times there, and you had a statement in your message that I think is really important. I would love for us to start by talking about, and your statement was, we don't make God more glorious. God is glorious. So if you would, as we get started, why don't you talk about what you meant by that, and maybe reference that uh, you had an illustration that I thought was really helpful with the eye chart. So yeah. Yeah, so I I think one of the mistakes that we make is that we think that there are ways in which God is dependent upon us in some way to reveal his glory and the bottom line is is God is glorious, he has been glorious and he will always be glorious. Um one of the passages that makes that abundantly clear is in John chapter 17. In verse 5, where Jesus is praying, and he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so one of the ways that we were trying to grapple with that and understand it is through the lens of going to an eye doctor. And you sit in your seat in the dark room, and on the other side of the Room is the that chart. dreadful eye chart, the man, chart. with the big E at the top. And, oh yeah, we and all they say, that chart. you know, cover yep. one eye and you know, read to me, you know, this line, and they point at the line, and like you're trying to to read it, and you put cover the other one up, and you try to read the line, and both eyes, you know, all that whole thing that everyone knows how to do. Um, I've had my eyes fixed so I can read it from across there without LASIK. the, oh, with, nice. without the yeah. machine. But at any rate. Uh, back in the day when I couldn't see, I couldn't I couldn't read the lines they wanted me to read. You know, I usually it'd be like the E at the top of the chart. <laughs> that. That's about it. I, that's where I uh, stopped. But then they, yeah. move, they move the machine in front of your eyes, and they start to go, you know, is this lens better or worse? And and at first, it's very easy to, to tell the difference. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's getting better. You know, number two, better. Oh, number two, better. And eventually the the line starts to come in more clearly. And the point that I was trying to make with that illustration of the the lenses is the chart didn't change the entire time. It might have been blurry to us or unseeable to us previously, but through the circumstances of changing the lenses, it we started to see what was actually there. And and I and I believe that that's really what the our lives start to reveal uh, over time is the glory that God is and has always been is being revealed to us more and more clearly through the creation, through the person of Jesus Christ, who is the the demonstration of God, the explanation of God, through the the ways that God works in our lives. Like He's helping us to see more and more clearly how glorious He is. Glory is the unveiling of of who God is. And God is showing us that more and more through certain things, but most specifically through his son and our savior, Jesus, we start to see what God is like. Right. And I I, I told you this story earlier, but I'll tell this again for our audience here. I, I'll never forget years ago, I was living in Florida, graduated college and time to get my license renewed. So I went to the DMV and I had to do the eye test. So I look in the little the uh, little uh, viewfinder there, whatever it is, lean my head against it, look in it, 
and I see nothing, just blank, just like looking at a blank wall. And so I'm looking for a switch on there, and I don't feel anything. So I said to the lady working, I said, hey, you're going to have to turn this on. I don't think it's on. She says, oh, no, it's it's on. <laughs> <laughs> you're not seeing it, but it's on. I'm like, uh, you sure? Because I, I don't see, like, fuzzy stuff. I see nothing. And then she, you know, switched it a few times, and finally I saw a, a fuzzy line of letters and— so she said, when's the last time you had your eyes checked? So that was uh, the discovery for me. That was a very uh, important moment where I realized, wow, yeah, I need glasses uh, badly. Like my vision's really bad. And I had somehow made it to that point without glasses. But that was a, a pretty significant moment of discovery for me. And I think about how when we see the reality of the cross, the reality of, one, our need because of our sin, because of how we are a constant harm to ourselves and others, seeing the reality of sin, the desperation of sin, the hopelessness of sin, and then seeing, wow, there's a loving God who sent his son for me to live for me, to die for me, to rescue me, to, to take me as an enemy and to, to make me his friend, um, to forgive me, all, all the amazing things that Jesus accomplished for us. In a sense, it's like it's like beginning to see. It's like realizing, wow, I was so blind. It, it, he was there the whole time. God has always been there. He, he's always been up to good in my life and your life and the lives of the people in this world. He, he's constantly uh, filling our lives with with good things, challenging things, but in the grand scheme, all from his perspective, good. And it's like something about God revealing himself to us through Christ where we start to see, oh, wow, there's a real connection point between me as a fallen human being, a struggling human being, and a kind, loving God who isn't just some generic, uh, they they used to say in philosophical debates, like the watchmaker in the sky who just kind of gets things going and lets them go. But no, he, he's actually actively involved in creation and loves his creation, including his creatures, including you and including me. So that's a, for me, I don't know, I just think of that pivotal moment in my life of just see, going from, you know, evidently blind, pretty blind, to then all of a sudden seeing um, through corrective lenses. It's like the gospel helps put on a new set of glasses to now start seeing what, what always has been there, to your and, point. And yeah. I think it's really important to, to get to the, the reality, the truth, that God in his kindness, opens our eyes to see the glory of who he is. In his kindness, helps us through circumstances to, to see more clearly how great he is and the truth of who he is. One of the mistakes we make is, is as if we think he needs us in some way because he's like craving someone to do something that will make him glorious when is the re the reality is this is who he is the his glory is his person and character and his kindness and his love and his truthfulness like we could go on and on about all the the yes, facets attributes. of it yep and we get to the place where we think um you know if if it you know if i don't do these things God's glory will be diminished, yeah. harmed in some way. Or if I do these things, God's glory will be enhanced. Now, there's a way in which um, people see him more clearly or see him less clearly. And I think that's where we might want to be uh, seeing the, the benefits of our privilege of letting people see him more clearly. Like, oh, look, look at what he's like, look at what he's done, look at who he is, and we can magnify the glory that's already fully uh, embodied in him. Right, and and that's where even as you and I were talking earlier today and kind of pre-briefing for this podcast, we were talking about that same concept and how uh, important it is to realize that the ability to glorify God itself even comes from God. And there's a great text, I think it's in John 5, where yes. you quote it, where it just says, no man glorifies God, right? And it's naturally speaking. And Romans 1 says that too, right? Mm -hmm. We don't, we fail to glorify him naturally. It doesn't in any way diminish his infinite glory. It, it, he is infinitely glorious. But by nature, we don't see nor reflect that um, 
in every way, um, even though that too is complicated. But um, but in in salvation, in God opening our eyes, there is also this newfound appreciation and ability to see, and in the seeing, there's also a way in which our lives do demonstrate God's glory um, in unique ways. John 15, Jesus says, and this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. And so there's a fruit bearing that goes on among God's people, but it's important to recognize the God who is himself glorious also takes upon himself the responsibility, ultimately, of displaying that glory in creation in a whole bunch of ways, including through his people. And in John 15, you have that picture of the, the vine dresser. It's God who's the vine dresser, right? It's it's Christ who is the vine. He's the source of life. And then these branches, through vital union, through believing in him, become conduits of his glory and the, the fruits of his glory. And the main one mentioned there in that context is love, of course. And so, so it, you know, it's not that we can't in any way display God's glory. It's just we tend to maybe inflate our control of that maybe, or uh, to your point, like we can think, well, if I if I don't do certain things or avoid certain things, I can somehow diminish his glory when it's it's impervious. His glory is invincible. That's a, that's, that's a really good word, impervious. Uh, impervious, help, impenetrable. Help, help, yeah. help the rest of us understand. Yeah, impervious. impervious. I, think in, I, that think, I think that comes from... Uh, <laughs> I feel like that comes from an old Superman movie or something, but it's like you know it can't be. But but I think that yeah. uh, that's a really good it's like invincible. That, that's a good illustration there, right? Like um, you punch punch Superman in the face, and he's like, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Um, God's glory is infinite and eternal. That's one of the things I try to convey at the beginning of the service yeah. last week. It's yeah. infinite. There's, there's no, uh, it's not limited, and it doesn't ever come to an end. It's Goes before, right. yep. now, and yep. forever. Always God has been, is always glorious, will be. and so there are ways in which people start to see it. Uh, there are ways that uh, our lives will show God's glory. We don't glorify, like we don't bring the glory, but there are ways in which there's a lens through which people are seeing God's glory. And that's that's what Jesus came to do. He showed us who God is. He is God himself, and he is the way that God is explained. If you want to see what God looks like, look at Jesus. He yep. said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've yep. seen the Father also. I and the Father are one. So Jesus is the demonstration and declaration of the fullness of grace and truth. He is glorious. God is glorious. And we have the opportunity to, to see it through the things he's made. We get to see it as he's revealed himself through through scripture. We, re, we experience it because God's spirit has been poured out into our lives. And then as those that are channels of God's spirit and God's power, there are ways in which people can see the glory of who God is. And, and I think what you're saying from John 15 in that vital union, uh, without me, you can do nothing. As we abide in him, believing him, there is a product of loving one another, um, a love for God himself and a love for other people. And God, God is his glory is displayed that way. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And um, that's I think that's all important, even in terms of, I, I don't know, as we started the conversation, it's going through my mind. Glory can sound like a very abstract idea. It can sound like it's out there. What is that? How, I mean, how do I understand that? Like in real clear, concrete ways, it can seem abstract, right? And I, I think of sometimes the Old Testament stories where God's like Shekinah glory is the term, you know, this is the brightness, right? And there's the cloud, of course, like you think of the Israelites, the fire at night and the cloud by day that led them and, and different manifestations of the temple, God's glory filling the temple in some ways. And it can just be uh, very... Um, unclear, I guess. And and so, one, there there are these manifestations, these illustrations that God uses to, in, even in those senses, give a glimpse at His greatness and His, whether it's His actual character or the things that God is able to do, His, his leading of His people, His presence with His people, but you really see that in greatest clarity in the incarnation of Christ, and that's why John 1 says, and I think you referenced it a minute ago, but uh, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Like, he is the in flesh, tangible expression of God's glory. He, he's he's the manifest greatness of God walking among us, and 
serving us, loving us, living for us, and then going on to die for us and rise for us. Uh, so it it makes it more clear that, again, there's this great God who, who is beyond us. He's bigger. He's smarter. Uh, you know, to use the big theological words, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present at the same time. He's just like so far beyond us, and yet he comes in the person of Christ to dwell with us and to help us see, right? So yeah, there's there's the glory of man, and in that you've got like at the Olympics, the top tier with the gold, and then the second tier to one side or the other, the silver, and then the third tier, the the bronze. Like that's there's one kind of glory, and then you get people talking about it. Maybe maybe you're the Michael Phelps of swimming, and you have all the gold medals there, or you're the uh, Usain Bolt yeah, right. uh, of running, or you know you're the U.S. basketball team. Whatever the you know, there's that kind of glory where it's like shine, look, look over here. Everyone talk and and give the applause. And then there's the way that the Bible portrays glory. And I, I think you referenced in, in some of the notes that you gave me the the Hebrew expression kavod, yeah. which just has the idea of heaviness, yeah. weight, weightiness. Yeah. Maybe we would call it gravity. There's something that it's it's really um, penetrating. God's glory is he doesn't need someone to say really good things about him for him to be glorious. The unveiling of God's glory is just can you, can you get a glimpse of what kind of a God he is who created everything out of nothing? He spoke the world into existence. Now you think about some of the things that he's made, and I know you're, we're going to talk about you know creation, but if you think about the way that Psalm 33 talks about it and the power and strength of the ocean, you've you've been in the ocean, and like you're nothing compared to its strength. Oh. It's like if, if, yeah, if you're even gonna, small if, waves can toss you around, oh, like nothing. you've got no yep. chance. If if, yep. if if the muscles wanted to flex, uh, excuse me, the waves wanted to flex their muscles on you. You know, our muscles are not going to, you know, stand up to it. Um, the, the, the weightiness and power of the ocean is, a, is amazing when you know about it. And the way that Psalm 33 talks about it is like God spoke and they stood fast. <laughs> it's like he has... Yeah, the wind and the waves obey him. They, they, right? They've got no chance against him. Like, it's just another way that the, the weightiness of who God is rules over the the natural elements that he's created. Um, God's kindness cuts through the most rebellious heart, right? Because you think about Romans 2 tells us that it's the kindness of God mm -hmm. that has brought us to repentance. We had impenetrable, hard, stubborn, unrepentant hearts, and he turned us to himself. And there are some that remain in their opposition, but God in his kindness, when, we, when you see it and experience it, he turns us. There's a weightiness to his glory that doesn't have to be exalted in order to remain glorious. Yeah, what's the passage we were talking about regarding uh, Jesus says, you know, I don't receive glory from men, basically. And he's, he, basically, yeah, you glorify was, yeah. one another. You, you pass glory back and forth, yep, in, but in, in John I don't receive five. glory from men, right? If another man comes in his own name, for his own reputation, you'll glorify him, you'll, you'll honor him, but I come from, in my Father's name for his glory, and I don't receive glory. So he's revealing something about the natural way, which is to glorify one another, and this fits with Romans 1. We worship creation more than the Creator, right? So we're happy to do that, and we're always looking for heroes, and we're looking for people to magnify, and, and there's an appropriateness like the Olympics and things like that that we can mm -hmm. appreciate every time sure. we watch a, a professional sporting event. Like, it's awesome to cheer people on and all that, but there's a sense in which, you know, we humans, it's almost like we're, we stop at that level, and when we then attribute glory to one another and to create things versus the God who gave Usain Bolt his ability mm -hmm. and who gave the U United States basketball team their abilities and even sustains their heartbeat and the breath mm -hmm. they breathe as they play, right? And Michael Phelps and 
you know, engineering his body such that he happens to have like the perfect frame to be a good <laughs> swimmer. You know what I mean? Literally everything from his, the length of his limbs to his shoulder, you know, uh, all of that, his wingspan, like that's not, he didn't pick that. He didn't, yep. he didn't engineer himself. And then so, he worked really hard. Then he worked hard say, hey, with good what job. he yep. Hey, we're, yep. we're happy that you, you yep. worked really hard. Yep. You kind of earned the steps beyond the natural giftedness, the spirit, you know, God given uh, ability, you, you honed your skill, you worked yeah. hard, you dedicated yourself, all that. That's great. Um, and it, it's, as soon as God says no more yeah. breath, it's over. As soon as God says, yeah, you don't have any strength left in those, those arms, you're, you're not swimming anymore. Um, so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting and we can you can kind of go off the rails in, in all the different ways that it can go. But God's power and giftedness and grace that that is common to all and experienced in certain ways in uh, certain through certain means in others is a uh, is a, a an experience that that we want to treasure. Yeah, here, here's a verse that might bring some of those concepts together. Is First Corinthians ten thirty one? It's a familiar verse where Paul says in the context of people debating whether it was okay to eat certain things and because of the associations, and he says in that context, he says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? So that's often quoted text where sometimes we can hear that and think, I know for me years ago, I would think of that in terms of, okay, if I'm doing even mundane things, if I'm eating, I'm drinking, I'm having breakfast in the morning, how do I, you know, do this to the glory of God? And like focusing really hard on, I got to do this to the glory of God. But what does that even mean? Well, as you were just talking about, and as we see throughout scriptures, this concept of, okay, common grace, God created all these things, everything from music to foods with all their tastes and smells to humor to, you know, all, all these different, all these different aspects of creation that we can enjoy. Uh, and of course, the example Paul gives there in that First Corinthians text is eating or drinking, and so we can partake of food and drink in a way that it doesn't make God any more glorious than He is, but it reflects His glory, or it um, celebrates His glory. Maybe a way to say it. it: it's it's glory to Him and saying, "Wow, this is from Him. He created flavors, and He created taste buds that's able to experience those flavors." and and you just realize as God opens our eyes to see all these aspects of creation are gifts from his hand. Every good thing comes from above, right? As it says in James 1, um, we can then partake of those gifts in a way that gives thanks to him and says, well, there, yeah, these are from him and, and I'm grateful to him for these things. And God is helping us to see that and experience it that way. It's like, okay, I, I have... I have a car to drive in, or I have a house to, to live in, or I have food to eat, and it has, uh, you know, various good tastes, or it's good for me, or whatever the case may be. Usually like, not both at the same time, unfortunately. A lot of times, not, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. But seeing it from his good hand is, is a way in which God's glory is reflected because we're seeing him in the reception of it. Right. And and that's I think the the import, the importance of seeing how God's glory impacts our day-to-day -day life as I go to, to work, giving thanks that God has worked so many aspects out to give me the opportunity to be a minister for him, to give me the opportunity to have people to to minister to um as you're enjoying your family, a, a, a spouse, whether it's husband or wife, with all the good that they bring and the challenges that they bring, mm -hmm. because every one of us brings both the good dynamics and the challenging dynamics to the table, and seeing both the good and the challenging as something that it comes from God's good hand for me, as if the God is sovereignly, shepherdingly, Fatherly, fatherly, fatherly. <laughs> yeah. Wow, he's really struggling <laughs> with that word. Yeah. As a good father, caring for me through the people that he's placed in my life, and saying, "God, I'm seeing you through the good that my wife brings, 
and I'm seeing you more clearly through the challenge that my wife brings. And that's, that's good. That's part of seeing God's glory because I'm seeing his hand in my life. I'm seeing that he hasn't just haphazardly allowed me to find some person and like it's it's all about me and 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 the and the way that I have orchestrated my life. And so because I worked hard in school, I, I got this job. And because I um you know wooed my wife, you know, my girlfriend just the right way, I got this this wife and like I you know I earned these children. No, God has superintended over all of these things, and God is showing me something about me through my family members, and God is showing me something about him through my family members. And, and in this way, like Christ is being magnified so I can glorify God in the mundane or regular aspects mm-hmm. of life because I'm, I'm starting to see him in it and see these things through him. Yeah, and another way that that concept is illustrated in Scripture, and it kind of requires the, combina- the combination of two different two different texts or passages and ideas, but so Isaiah 6 says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So there's this idea of, okay, the earth is full of God's glory. It's full. And then Ecclesiastes, which we studied not too long ago here at the church, over and over again, Solomon uses the word vanity or emptiness. And so it's like, okay. And it's like, there's just all this void in his experience in creation. There's all this emptiness. And so we could ask the question, all right, which is it? Is it, is it full? Because it's, because Isaiah 6 says it's full of his glory. And then Solomon says, well, there's an emptiness. So how do we, how do we marry those two? How do we harmonize those two concepts? Even when we go back to thinking about processing through the book of Ecclesiastes as a church, and, and even if you're reading through it on your own, when we try to make take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, we find it to come up short. When we try to worship the created thing rather than the creator— we will find ourselves mixed in vanity and emptiness and and futility is, is a way that it gets uh, understood. When we have the eternal void in our inner person filled with an infinite God, then we start to see all the, the elements of creation as good gifts to us. When we try to fill the eternal void with the good gifts, we find them to be lacking. So one of the things that I find very interesting from the book of Ecclesiastes, the word vanity, I think, is used like high 20s. Yeah. The word tov in Hebrew is used in the 30s. Hmm. So tov is the word good. Mm -hmm. So Solomon isn't only talking about futility. He's talking about futility here and good here. And when when our minds and hearts are rightly aligned, when our eyes have been opened to see God for who he really is, and our hearts have been filled with his eternal value, with himself, really, the way that we process through looking at the stream streaming is glorious. Uh, I want to. I, well, I've talked to you about going up to the Kangamangas. Yeah, Highway. we haven't made it up there yet. It's two called years the, in. The, we haven't the, made the, it yet. The Swift we River. Will. Yeah. It, like I, I love looking at it. It's beautiful. Um, it, it's, it's, it's peaceful, and s- kind of strong at the same time, depending on what part of the Swift River you're, you're in. Solomon looked at that when he was deeply pensively thinking in futility terms, and he looks at that and thinks, you're streaming stream, but you're not accomplishing anything. It's like, it's not like you're filling up the ocean and like where you're coming from isn't emptying out. It just keeps on going and and like endlessly, like to what end? So what's the point? 
what's the point? But for a person who's who's been filled and you look at the glory of something that God has made, it's like a good gift to see the the fresh streaming water. It's it's like it really is the lens through which we view something. Kind of going back to the lens illustration. If you've got no lens on and it's blurry, it's kind of mm-hmm. like I don't know, like what what am I even seeing here? What's the point of all this? But when the lens gets in front of the eyes and you start to see what's on the other side, it's like, look at the glory of God. And the glory of God is seen in these regular pieces of life where the, the stream is streaming or the orchards. You know, the, um, if you think about the the architecture, architecture that he he had worked so hard to build, like there are ways in which you can experience that very fruitfully if we see it as a good gift of God or the opposite. It's like, okay, I'm trying to get something out of this and it's just, it's not working. I don't, yeah. I don't have, it's not, it's not filling the void. And one of the lenses that helps us the most with that, I'm thinking of in Colossians, one of the themes in the book of Colossians is where it says that in Christ, one of the translations is we are complete in him. Okay. In Christ, we are complete. And, and that word complete is in other places translated full filled or filled up. Right. So as we see, wow, the the void that was there because of us not being in relationship with our Creator has been filled through Christ who brings us back into relationship with our Creator. Now all these aspects of creation that are filled with His glory, they do reflect His glory, they manifest His creativity, His brilliance, His wisdom, all of that. Now it all comes together in this relationship where we are in relationship with our Creator and in this storyline where there is a story being told, and it's a story of creation and fall and redemption and restoration, and so creation and creatures are all part of this grand narrative, not just meaningless, and I mean, it can appear that way if you don't see the this grand scheme of things. It can appear that way, but in reality, it's absolutely meaningful, and it's part of this story that's being told, this great story that's being told, and the main character being God himself, and the main point being the sharing of glory with his creatures. In fact, that isn't in John 17 where he talks about sharing his glory with his people. And and we might think, well, that means I'm going to get to be, you know, like from a a Mormon perspective, you know, they believe they're going to become what God is. They're, they're going to somehow uh, ascend to that level to be like God in that way. And that, that's not the, the narrative that we've come to understand and believe, but we will forever see him as magnificent mm-hmm. and great and will be fully satisfied and complete in the seeing of God's greatness and and fully free and fully blessed in every way and celebrating forever his yeah. greatness. So it's it's a seeing, it's a tasting, it's a knowing, and it's a believing. And the benefit of that is to be in union with him. And it says, then in union with one another, that they may be one as we are one. Um, So like the the benefit that comes our way as God opens our eyes and helps us to clearly see the kind of God he is. And the way that we see it most clearly is in Christ. I think that's one of the things that we we still want to talk about uh, this afternoon in this time is like the glory of God is seen in a naked, bloodied Savior hanging on a tree. Yeah, that's counterintuitive. That doesn't make sense to our natural way of thinking. That's a weird way, seemingly, to show off, right? And if if you think about it, the that which necessitated or provoked a bloody, naked, crucified Savior is my sin. My sin saying, God, I I got this. I got this. I don't need you. I've got my own way. I'm going to find happiness. I'm going to find joy. I'm going to find fulfillment in my job. I'm going to find it in this person. I'm going to find it in this food. I'm going to find it in this car. I'm going to find it in this house. I'm going to find it in this vacation. I I I got it. I'm all set. I'm going to go and pursue after it in this through, through these other means, and I'm tasting death, and God says, I have something for you. I, I want to give you real life 
and I want to give you real joy, and I want to give you real satisfaction, and the way that I'm going to do that is by taking all that death upon myself. God's glorious demonstration, showing forth his mercy, he, that wouldn't be highlighted without my sin. My sin highlights God's merciful, kind love. And like you, it's, it's seen most clearly in our crucified Savior. Absolutely. I, I'm thinking of that moment of Christ's crucifixion bring together all the realities you just shared. And another way of saying it would be, you know, it, it demonstrates how we how we treat God. Like Romans says, we're at enmity with him. And that we can soften that, but that's a pretty harsh idea. It's like we're at enmity. We're hostile against our creator. We don't always feel or sense that, but that's what he says is true of us. Regardless of whether we think that's true or feel that's true, it's true. And he says, behold, look, look at how you treat me. And look at how I treat you. And that's, it's other, it's unique. And both it's of those glorious. are seen in one In, in one, one instance, they come together right there, right? And, and we deserve wrath and to be turned aside and to be turned over to our own devices. That's what we deserve. And humanly, that's what we would get. We all have the limitations. If someone pushes our buttons enough, we're done with them, you know? And, and God's infinite patience and mercy and love to to see that we are really our own biggest problem and then how we treat him, which is the root of all that, and to come and rescue us is truly amazing. In fact, I'll share, um, you and I were talking just days ago about a situation, not a huge deal, but just something, some stuff my daughter, one of my daughters was going through at school, and I was telling you about how this kid was kind of harassing my daughter, picking on her, and again, it wasn't a huge deal, but the aspects of it, you know, you and I as dads with mm -hmm. girls and all, like, that's not cool. So we were talking about that, and... I don't know, at one point in the conversation just occurred to, to both of us as we're talking, oh, yeah, like my natural way would be, oh, I have a certain way I would naturally handle that. Mm -hmm. And then you think of how God not only witnesses what plays out with his son, but orchestrates it, writes that story mm -hmm. so that he might redeem us and rescue us and bring us to himself It's just truly amazing. That's his glory. That's it's, his greatness. It's the unveiling of his greatness. Yeah. God, who God is, is displayed right then and there. And I can't take away from it, and I can't add to it. So I guess the question as we, we wrap up, mm -hmm. we've talked about a lot of true things, and they're valuable. How does this concept help you on a Monday morning? Yeah. Or a Friday night, as it were. Yeah. One thing that helps me about it is, and that's why I really want, I started with that quote, because I like that quote in your sermon of just, hey, he is, just knowing God is glorious. It's just true. It's like objectively true. Whatever dumb creatures do with that, it's still true. So that's a really grounding reality because of the ups and downs and twists and turns of life. Sometimes um, it's just good to know that that's the reality, that it's not ultimately dependent upon me. That's another form of relief. So there's that. But then there's just, because that's true, in those moments where you where you can enjoy something in common, in common grace, in creation, something, some simple pleasure, or, you know, eating or drinking, or a, a good conversation with our, our wife or our children, or something like that. Like, those are moments to say, wow, God, thank you. These reflect your even these reflect your relational nature. These reflect in some way your kindness, uh, the love of a child for their parent. This reflects in somehow my my relationship with you. That It's a great gift. There's, there's moments where those dots connect in our minds, and I think those are great, sweet moments, right? And then, you know, you brought up earlier some of the darker sides of life, some of the more difficult sides of life. It's not always that way. There's just conflict. There's disappointment. There's frustration with one another. Then in those parts of life, in the aches and pains and everything else, there's the there's the reminder of uh, the difference between God and us and the kind of love that we've beheld at the cross, right? And say, wow, God, to know that you have that kind of love, and that's the kind of love with which you love me and with which you love my kids and with which you love my church. 
Like those two are great moments of of celebration of the, the glory of God. And and then I think as as those realities more and more take root in our hearts and minds, there's a mysterious way in which God, as per John 15, he caused us to bear fruit. He caused us to be channels of that kind of love, vessels of that kind of love. And um, I tend to not try to overthink exactly how that is. Um, I don't know that I can always estimate it accurately, so I, I'm more inclined to just say, you know, I, I know that that's true. And then it's always encouraging, and you know this too as a pastor, right? One of the greatest things about what we get to do for work is, you know, hearing from people who appreciate, hey, thank you for this kind word or this or that thing you did or said or it helped me in that moment. Well, okay, that you're probably getting a glimpse that God used you in that way, and then still we can come back and say, well, thank you, God. If that was fruitful, if that helped that person, thank you for allowing me to be a channel to help that person. Right. What do you think? I, I think it's it's that not uh, missing what's in front of your face, not missing uh, what God is doing, not missing the the joy of whatever you're going to f- experience tonight. That might be great, um, whether it's a good meal with your family. I, I, I was thinking about, you know, this, is, this has been a kind of a rough week and a bit of a rough stretch uh, for me personally, just with the a lot of different tensions getting pulled in, in lots of different directions, and then some of the weighty conversations that I've been a part of. Um, it, it's been kind of a, a rough little stretch. And then you and I had a chance in our pre-brief to talk, and like, that's a blessing. And it's a way in which God gifts to us a way of clarifying what's most important and I don't want to dismiss those those good things. I don't want to miss what's right in front of my face. Um, I'm going to go home in a little while. I'm going to, going to have some dinner with my family. And I don't want to miss what's in front of my face. My, my daughter has a, a wedding shower tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be a part of it because I'm a guy and guys don't go to the showers. <laughs> I'm not I'm not bothered by yep, that. That's but I am all from, right. from a distance gonna celebrate like this is a, a good thing that God what is it represents. Yeah. This is another kindness. I don't want to discount it. And like like we all have also have said, there are gonna be some challenges that are gonna come, whether it's um some news that comes my way or a text message that comes my way that's uh either difficult because someone's going through something or some conflict that will come up. Uh, in a, in a relationship, I don't want to discount. Okay, God, you're you're at work here. This is this is part of you unveiling how good you are, and how one day there's going to be none of this left. I'm going to experience the fullness of His glory. Whereas here, I'm I'm getting bits and pieces yeah. of it. Yeah. So like, there's there's a coming day that I'm going to see and know fully as I am known, and that that day is coming, and this is good. So I, I want to not discount the good and the challenging uh, here in this life. I think there's good in all of that. Yeah, for sure, man. Absolutely. And and I know it's I know it's our prayer and our goal and and among our leadership, like our desires that when we come together, whether it's on a Sunday or Wednesday, whenever we come together, that we can have that moment of reflection and, and in a fresh way behold God's glory and think about the cross and sing about it and and just remember the kind of creator that we have, right? So there's another aspect of, okay, practically speaking, we have that opportunity. We have that privilege every week to meet, and uh, and may God help us, right? May God help us as we meet to to see him and to see more clearly, like those lenses on the machine they use in the eye doctor's office, you know, just to be able to see more clearly uh, who our good God is, what he's up to, and to remember the great hope that we have in Christ. So that's probably a good place to to put an end to the conversation for now, although it's always going to be continued um, in some form. So uh, if you would close us, man, I'll close Let's us in prayer. It. All right. Father, thank you that you you share an awareness with us of what you're like, the glory that you are. We have tasted and seen that you are gracious We have been made aware of your great love with which you've loved us. Your mercy and kindness impress us and turn us to you afresh. 
We're thankful for the good gifts of this life, friendship, companionship, fullness of our needs so many times. We're thankful for the beauty of what you've created. We pray that you'd help us to experience the joy of knowing you and believing you. We pray that you would give us both peace and joy and satisfaction in you. And we pray, Father, as we see and know that we would be ready to declare what we've learned and what we know you to be. And we pray, Father, that others too would see clearly that you'd give life and joy to others of knowing Jesus and knowing you through Jesus. Give us grace as we depart tonight. We pray that we would be uh, enjoying what you've given and reflective of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.